So here we are with Mrs. Crajan at the firehouse. Uh, we're doing an interview and asking her both as a, a business person but also as a cultural person in the area to give us some of her perspective uh, on a variety of, of uh, issues surrounding the development of the health sciences campus mm -hmm. and the community. So we're going to begin by asking how long have you been in the area and specifically within Johnson City? And that can be for your business. Well, well this project, the Goodwill yeah. Theater yeah. Uh, project, has been in existence since the year 2000. And at that point it was volunteers uh, working together and then in 2002 we incorporated. About 2003, 2004 is when we located our offices in Johnson City uh, when we purchased an additional building and were able to be on site uh, where the project is happening. And that's about the time that the Goodwill Theater was donated to the organization okay. and we began um, the initial stabilization. And from there, then the feasibility plans and, and all the other plans started to um, take effect and okay. we realized we need to purchase additional property and, and things like that to really make this work, which meant a big investment on our part sure. in the village. Beautiful. Okay. Um, I want to move on and ask questions about if there are any problems that you would like to see dealt with in the short run. And we had a little conversation before we, we started filming about the university and the state has made a big investment here. Yes. And there are things they can do, but there are also things they can't do. Mm -hmm. And that is deal with some of the local problems if you see any. So the uh, open-ended question is, are there issues or problems in this neighborhood first. We're going to talk about the neighborhood, Johnson City later, but in the neighborhood, by that we mean between here and Main Street and the side streets that go up to Main Street. Well, one of the big problems here is that it's a transient neighborhood. Mm -hmm. uh, none of the people who um, are residents here, very few of them are here more than six months at a time, and then there's a turnover. Uh, just because they're, uh, the properties in this immediate area are slum properties, and uh, a lot of the people stay for a while, stop paying their rent, then takes two to three months to be evicted, and then they're evicted, and then a new group will you know, move in and in the various properties. So there's a constant rollover happening all the time, which means there's no personal investment um, in the area. And plus, a lot of these people are, have fallen on hard times or are criminals, uh, so they don't have an investment in the community. And uh, that can be troublesome. You know, sometimes we have a wave of people who are, you know, nice and, you know, mm -hmm. just quiet or whatever. And sometimes we have a whole lot of children on the street that obviously are not in school. And we have, you know, we care about that. Um, and that's a safety issue too. Uh, and then sometimes we have a higher level of criminal uh, problems, uh, which was worse when we didn't, um, own some of the properties next to us. We've now purchased some of them and we'll be tearing them down. But there was a high level, um, the last two to three years of criminal activity immediately next door. And that's, um, that's scary. Yeah. So there's, there's that disinvestment by the residents. Um, and I do think this area is going to change to be a diff very different form of residential community. And a lot of the residential uh, properties, I think, may switch over to commercial, obviously, and, you know, in a response to um, the university presence, but also to the presence of our facility, because we are going to be, you know, an entertainment facility that's bringing a lot of people in, so there's opportunity for additional investment there. So the, the community will change drastically and needs to, um, and so on one level, it's good that they're transient and not rooted because I don't think there'll be a huge fight about moving. Um, but at the same time, these people have to go somewhere and it would be nice if wherever they went, which probably should not be right next to retail, uh, but wherever they go is a drastic improvement to where the type of places they've been living. So uh, I have heard that there is a um, a group of people who would like to put in some um, low-income housing, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm not sure that the location, what location they're choosing. Uh, but I think there's definitely a need for uh, 
better quality, low income housing um, in an appropriate place that, that fits into the neighborhood but is not um, a deterrent uh, to um, moving the neighborhood forward. Yeah, just uh, information. I was curious about this myself. So <clears throat> I went to Sun Sunrise is developing the big mm -hmm. structure. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, on their website, they have a history of doing mixed housing. Right, and mixed housing and, and um, middle income and, and lower income in the affordable housing world is different than the Department of Social Services right. low income. That's right, public person. housing. Public one, housing. Right, so is, I used the wrong term, really. No, no, I was I using say, public housing needs to happen, yeah. just not by retail and not in the middle of, of some of the other. I don't mean to put it way, way I away and shun it, but it, that needs to happen in addition to the, the mixed and affordable Good. housing that's happening in that, the that's development. Well. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, now one that maybe is easier, <laughs> and that is the BU Health Sciences campus. Some people look at it very positively, others look at it and say, well, there's some issues. But let's start with the positive. What do you think is the most positive impact? Well, the, the most positive, in, there's two, two really positive impacts. And one of them is simply a focus on Johnson City. Johnson City has been totally forgotten. Um, a lot of the investment from the state and the county was Binghamton centric or Endicott centric and nobody was really paying attention to Johnson City which falls under the town of Union and so it just gets forgotten. Uh, so just um, having something located here we're shining a light on this community that's in the direct center that is the community surrounding the biggest employer which is UHS um, is, is critical. Number two, I think um, what's really wonderful is the fact that they are doing a, a repurposing and rehabilitation of the one big factory. And we, when we started this project, we were afraid that no one was going to keep any of the factories. And I don't think that you should keep every single historic building or every factory, but this entire village was created as a factory town. It did not exist until the Lester Boot and Shoe Company came here and built a factory and then things you know, happened around it. So we have always been concerned that, that we keep the legacy in place and there's at least a remnant of why this village started. So the fact that they're gonna be doing that um, beautiful old factory um, and then now Regan is doing the really old factories that you know came in very early. Um, that keeps our project in context, and it also you know states to the um, to the person who's visiting this is how this started. Now where it goes in the future, that's that's a whole another dimension. But at least we we have the legacy of the beginning of of the village, and I think people want to know that and want to honor it. Yeah, and that's why I said we're, gonna, we're going to develop a cultural element this too, mm -hmm. and we've had people suggest that to us that it would be mm -hmm. a good idea. But I think you know there might be a threshold coming here too, where there are enough buildings that it's going to bring people that want to talk about the history of this area and the culture of this area. One of the things uh, we created a health and cultural master plan, mm -hmm. and within that master plan, um, we identified um, a, a walking path that's like. Um, I think it's one mile and then there's an additional uh, second mile that goes up to CFJ Park. But we have noted where those historic stops are. Oh, nice. And they, those are places where we could have podcasts and things like that and historic markers, um, if not mural imagery or um, Could we call knows? on you again in the future to tell us where some of this thing Oh, is? yes. And we could put that into the cultural Yes, part. definitely. And we also made a national um, a register district. Um, and so we identified anything that had history. And we also did, um, the building that we have our offices in is the old EJ Medical Building. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not a building that EJ built. Um, it was a billiard hall and a, and a creamery. Um, but um, he then took it over and turned it into an infirmary, a dentist office, a, you know, all those things when he took those things out of the original factory. So we're not saving that building because it's been modified so many times and it's not a good building and it's 
falling down around our ears. But <clears throat> we did document the story using some state resources. And the story of a, what I believe, and someone could research and it'd be a great master's thesis, um, is that I believe this was the first medical plan offered to workers in the country. And it was one that actually made money. So I think it's a very important story now. Um, and the whole idea that um, EJ gave back to their workers um, with the hot lunch, with the um, fresh vegetables, with the recreation, with um, the culture, with the medical. And it all started in this little intersection, which is the intersection that's being saved, really, and, and, and brought back to life by the university and our project. So this is kind of the intersection where the idea of the person, uh, the employer and the employee working together and having this kind of balanced life of work, play, health um, actually started. So I think it's really interesting that that's now where the university is located, where we've got our project located. So this can once again become that intersection of culture, economic development, and science. I think that's incredible that's that's that that has come back. I gotta tell you why I'm smiling is because with a couple of other people, we're putting in a federal proposal that's due in January mm -hmm. to talk about <clears throat> trying to archive and create another one of these story maps about mm -hmm. all of this. This would be cultural and historical. You would be a great consultant if I can call on oh, you. Oh, sure. I, I'm more than happy to. And I would also be able to identify who the consultants and local people are who idea. are who have the most reliable um, history and are the most forthcoming. I will be contacting you. Yes, Thank because you very they're much. still around and they know the stories. Well, this is why we want to capture some of this now. Yes, too. it's. You know, you're going to capture it 20 years from now. True, right? true. And uh, Mrs. Scanlon, okay. who is EJ's granddaughter, is no spring chicken. So you might want to talk to her sooner than Absolutely. later. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Now, shifting it to the other side, or do you have any concerns about the health sciences campus? Is there any downside in your mind? Well, one of, obviously one of the things that it's also a need that I keep hearing a lot, because we've been here for 15 years and because I've been fairly vocal about the project, <coughs> excuse me, and some of the needs of Johnson City, um, before uh, the university um, decided to, to have this project. Um, sometimes people come to me um, and express concerns or ask questions rather than go to the mayor's office. So, and we're here, we're visible, you know. Mm -hmm. So, um, I do keep hearing um, that there's parking pressure and there's obviously a, a huge need for parking. There's a parking need that the, you know, hospital has that they will take care of and they have funding streams to take care of it. The university has funding streams to take care of their own parking pressure. But the last thing the village needs is a lot of empty, isolated lots that, that cause crime. They're locations for crime at night. And I don't care how many lights you put on them and how many fences you put around them, um, these are not good. And it's very difficult for a small business owner to start a project in Johnson City because there is not enough parking for whatever business they want to do. There's a lot of little places on Main Street. Um, there's a lot of people who park in the Red Robin Diner right. that are really going over to the Green Owl and then there's all sorts of you know people getting angry. and um, So there's, there is a drastic need for a parking ramp there's probably a, a need for two, you know, one on either side of Main Street in order to spur private development. And it's a chicken and egg thing. I don't know, you know, I don't think you'll get the businesses until you get the parking lot. And the parking lot, if it's done first, is going to be half empty in the beginning. Yeah. So there's a, a huge need for some kind of solution to that. And, and um, Binghamton grew and now it's got a parking need and there's no more real estate to put it on. So it would be smart to designate those places. I would prefer that they occur where there's a high level of blight and crime, which to me is two for one shoe polish, which is the way I'd like to spend my tax dollars.
but I don't know, right now there's a reluctance on the county and um, obviously the village doesn't have the money, um, but the town, there should be some way that they can work with federal um, dollars and create at least one so that there could be this critical mass in this area and prove that it's beneficial and then perhaps plan one. Um, but uh, that, I just keep harking on that because I know I hear from people who say, well, I'd love to put such and such there, but, you know, I, I won't get a yes from the planning board right now because, you know, there's not enough room. A facility like ours, a cultural facility, you want people to park a couple blocks away at a nice restaurant or something like that or go to the shops before they come to us or to go to those places after. But there needs to be some place that, you know, there needs to be that restaurant, there needs to be that shop, there needs to be that, you know, uh, pastry uh, place or ice cream place. Those places need to exist for people to want to park there or park near there to visit that. And they're not going to happen for uh, patrons of the Goodwill or for um, people visiting the pharmacy school or for students if there's no parking for those businesses. And those businesses do not have the money and there isn't real estate for them to buy a parking lot for each one. So the we don't plan. Yeah, <laughs> the parking is, is, is huge and it's, it's really important, I think, to get out in front of it, which is costly and risky, but it's the right way to do it. So we'll see. Do you see a role for the university in this? I do, I mean, I have talked, um, with the powers that be about um, the possibility, at least for my project, you know, we're an off-peak hour project mm -hmm. because things don't start till seven or eight. Um, we do have programming, you know, during the day on the mm -hmm. weekends, and we will be a teaching facility during the day. But, but still, the main parking pressure is is at night for our facility, which is when other people's die down until the restaurants become a hot scene, which will happen. So they, there has been discussion and, and we're looking into coordinating some access for us to, for the pharmacy school parking that will not be as full at night and can we, you know, do that. I think the university is more apt to give us um, that kind of reciprocal agreement, but they're not going to do it for 20 little mom and pops. No, they're not. Okay. So there's that parking issue still remains for us, for it to spur the type of development that you want to have happen. Um, <clears throat> I think you've said some of these things, but I'm going to try to pull it together. <clears throat> the question is, <clears throat> what problems exist in the village now beyond just this neighborhood, or if you include this neighborhood, but what does the village need to do to make this ready for the, the influx of new people? The village needs um, planning support. And it, unfortunately, you know, the, the current st structure of the village um, is pretty bare bones. Uh, it's a part-time position for the mayor and not paid very well. Um, there's very little staff. And a couple years ago, I forget when, um, they somewhat consolidated with the town of Union. So the planner went over there, the, the planner that was <clears throat> excuse me, in Johnson City, became a code officer. Um, so there's, there are a lot of grant opportunities out there through the state, through the federal government, um, that are not being accessed um, that, uh, because there is not a planning department and a senior planner and someone educated as a planner working that. They have a grant writer, very nice person, with a business degree but not an urban planning degree and, and does not have a, a large level of experience. The county is, you know, is very busy with the city of Binghamton and county overall county plans, but focusing on the incredible opportunity here, there's no staff. And there's and so, you know, you can't get all that angry about it when there's you know, there's only three people that are supposed to be doing the jobs that where there used to be eight. You know, so you know, there's no one on site in Johnson City as a planner looking at everything on a day-to-day -day basis. So there needs, that needs to happen. Um, or there needs to be more coordination 
with the Town of Union and there has to be a realization from the Town of Union that they need to dedicate more resources uh, to make sure that planning occurs. Um, there's all this, lots of um, fractured activities. You know, that was what we were hoping the master plan would take care of, but then it, it, there, nobody could decide who would implement it or implement which pieces of it. So what's occurring is duplication of effort. Um, you know, the university's trying to be a good citizen and do what it's doing. We're trying to do what we're doing and a little extra, and everybody's little extra may be, you know, replication. And we don't have enough time or dollars for replication. We need sure. to to have somebody pulling it together. Yeah, somebody to coordinate it. Right, yeah. and that would normally be village government, but it can't be in this instance because of the structure of the situation. Um, and there does not, at this point, seem to be an impetus from the Town of Union to take on that role. Okay, very good. Um, now I'm going to ask you, I said this earlier, about a scale. Did they warn you that I have long-winded answers? No, oh, but okay. I, don't, I don't think they're long-winded, they're very informative, so, okay. yeah. Um, I want to ask you about, on a scale of 1 to 10, 1 low, 10 the highest, what's your attachment, affinity to Johnson City? Is it high? Is it in the middle? The bottom? Oh, I, I really like Johnson City, I, so it's very high. Okay. I would, um, I guess I'd give it a 9, because okay. I get a little frustrated. Um, <laughs> but um, I think the village has so much potential, given where it's located, where these three um, uh, highways come together, uh, the fact that it's it's really directly center, you have to go through Main Street to get to Endicott and, and, and well, et cetera. Um, it's, the thing about it that, that is frustrating is, is the fact that so many people have gotten used to coming in and leaving and coming in and leaving and not staying. So that's what has to really change. Um, is having places to stay for and getting out of that habit of just, you know, get in the car and go, come, come here for the least amount of time. And also being a regional hospital where it's the trauma center, the neonatal, the cyber knife, the cardiac, etc. We bring a huge amount of people in, but they don't end up nurturing. They have a reason. They don't <laughs> nurture the village when they're here. And so there's the danger of that also happening uh, with, the, uh, with the college. So, uh, but I think this village is also human scale. It's, it, the architecture is funky. The architecture is cozy. So there has, I have known of the county needing um, a 24-7 funky space for the last 20 years. And they have been saying, when will we find that little area, that little pocket of Broome County that can be cool and can be 24-7? I don't think it can be the city of Binghamton because it's got so many government offices and law firms and things like that that roll up at 430. So this area being the one that could be that, you've got a 24-7 R&D facility coming in here the arts are pretty much 24-7 because most of what we do is at night and artists create whenever they feel like it or whenever the urge strikes. And then you've got a, you know, a huge hospital that's 24-7. The Walmart's 24-7. The Press and Sun over there is the Gannett facilities 24-7. You have some critical mass for 24-7 to occur that you don't have anywhere else. And that's one of the reasons I think this is such such an opportunity for a different kind of business and a different kind of activity. I think of like Rice Village in, in Houston that's near Rice University. It's its own little pocket within the larger community. I think this potential is here. Great, thank you. One last question, and that is, um, do you think given all the potential that you'll have to alter your business plan in any way? Well, we actually, we already have. Um, we were originally going to be a um, purely a uh, performance entity, a four-stage performance entity with a training academy for mostly backstage. Um, and then with the advent of the um, university being so close by and then the growth of, of what the university planned to do, we realized that um, we needed to add the ability to be a, a conference center to our project. So we have changed some of the 
uh, the ways the rooms are organized in the center connecting building mm -hmm. and um, making sure that there's more um, conference support uh, facilities put into the plan with more catering options. Uh, so we, we realize that we can um, have, you know, small symposium, seminar, things like that, that we could be that support um, for the university on occasion when it's needed and then realize we could be the same for the hospital. So, you know, when we have, you know, auditoriums that can hold 300 people, 200 people, and in large rooms that can hold um, additional breakouts and things like that, and then the 850 seat space, that's a lot of support for, a, you know, a conference center that could be right across the street. So that's been our response. That's very good. Okay.